thank you for having me. This is always a pleasure. Um, you know, I know the pandemic has been hard on all of us, but one of the, the really kind of unique things that has come out of it is the fact that I don't have to get on an airplane and fly out and see you. I can do this virtually. Uh, and one of the things about the Bamberger Ranch is it's really hard, even though I'm going to show you lots of beautiful photographs, it's really hard unless you're actually here to really understand the change. So with that, I'm going to dive right into the presentation, and I'm going to be coming in and out of um, video like this. I've got a fancy switchboard. So I like to start my presentations um, with, with quotes that kind of relate to everything. And when you read this, this is like a textbook example of how systems work. Each organism has a role. Each role has a check to ensure it's regulated. The crux of the natural world are these, are these checks and balances. For every yin, there's a yang. But to understand this requires patience, persistence, and most importantly, experience. So my challenge to all of you today is to just spend 15 minutes sitting in a spot outside, watching a spot, narrow your focus in, get to know that spot. It doesn't matter if you're looking um, at a tree or a patch of grass. Then tomorrow go to that same spot, but look at it from a different view. And when you see it from all the way around and you see what's going on in that one spot, you'll start to understand that that spot is its own system. And so to, to understand these systems is really what ecology is. And nowadays, ecology is a subject that we're all familiar with as a concept. We've all heard the term and most people consider it important, even if they are unsure of exactly what it is. The exact meaning though can be tricky. And there are a lot of different definitions, but there can no doubt be in all, any of our minds how important ecology is because this makes it all the more critical that we understand what ecology is and how we do it. This is the understanding of the systems and understanding all spots, big and small. So the key concepts, my goals over the next um, few hours with you is for you to understand these things. This is not gonna be a college textbook lecture you know, and there's a lot of these concepts that are going to be buried in the presentation, and you need to kind of dig it out and see it. So this is really an opportunity for all of you to see why it's important for yourself and your journey into land stewardship to be able to make concepts into connections through your experience. So let's view this, this whole lecture as a chance to get to know a system. And the system that you're all getting a chance to know right now is the way I present. So you're all welcome, right? So now the definitions of ecology um, have been around uh, since the late 1880s. And uh, um, this, this word ecology comes from um, a, a Germanic um, background. And Ernest Haeckel, who was a disciple of Darwin, first coined this term in, in 1866. And it's been modified through the years in one of the first textbooks on ecology uh, by Rick Lifts. It's a really famous book. Um, you know, he had his own view there in 73 of what it was. And it's kind of continued and every ecologist, every university professor has their own exam. And when I took ecology um, at Texas A&M, my final had one question and it was, what is the definition of ecology? Not as in here is a textbook definition, but what does it actually mean? And so to me, ecology is the scientific study of the distribution and abundance of organisms and the interactions that determine distribution and abundance. So when you think about forestry, you need to see the big picture. How do the soil microbes interact with the roots? And how do those roots and how does that soil determine the health of the tree and the health of the forest? what's there and what's not there. All those interactions are what ecology is. You know, it's famously said to truly see the forest, you have to see past the trees. And that's the overlying arch of um, what I'm gonna be talking to you about today. North America is a vast landscape and it has many major ecoregions. 
So when I think about, um, when I'm using this term system, I want you to think that system, ecosystem, ecotone are all the same thing, okay? Every time I bring up that word, it's all the same. I use them interchangeably. So no matter where you are in North America, you're a part of some kind of system. So the middle part here, let's see if I can get my laser pointer to work. This part here, that's the Great Plains. So that's kind of where I am in Central Texas, right where that red dot is, right? Where you are is right up here, and that's considered a um, temperate forest zone, you know, and a temperate Sierra. So you're kind of at that transition zone, much like I'm from Eastern um, temperate forest into the grassland community. But this is a large scale view of things. So when we think about the Bamberger Ranch, we're right in the middle of Austin and San Antonio. Austin is actually right here where the name is um, blocking that up. And that's really important because Austin is the, the Austin area. This whole swath here is one of the fastest growing areas in the entire um, continent, most of the United States. So we're, we're in trouble. So, this stretch from 35 right here is no longer a sleepy little one stoplight um, area. Texas is 95% privately owned. So when you look at this map, here we are. And you look at all these darker green patches, right? There's not much when you think about this broad slide here. And this map is only showing you about 100,000 hectares. So it's not a very large swath. And the hill country is what is called the Edwards Plateau. So you can see this, this blue system in the middle of the state here with Austin and San Antonio right on the edge. So where the Bamberger Ranch is, we're really close to some of those other eco zones. Um, and it's mostly grassland, but it's really this wooded savanna type area. So that's important to know, because if you don't know what system you're dealing with, you can't begin to think about managing that system. So we're gonna look as, at, at our grassland savanna as a model. And when you think about grasslands here in North America, from Canada all the way down into um, Central America was grass or grass connected with um, forest systems that we call savannas. So I know this is a forestry class, but for my little part of here, I'm gonna to talk to you a lot about this grassland system and why it's important. One of the reasons that these grassland systems are so important is because most of this isn't grass anymore. Most of this is crop space. It's big ag. And um, it's on top of one of the most important aquifers in the entire world called the Ogallala. We'll talk a little bit more about aquifers and such later. So again, just a reminder, you know, right here is where I am, right where that red dot is. So when we think about the hill country, we think about Texas, we got to tell you the story about settlement and how the, how the um, hill country became the hill country. It was very desirable for the European explorers to come here because when they first showed up, there was water everywhere. Springs flowed so strong, you couldn't even touch the wall where the spring was coming out. The story of Texas, the story of the hill country is all tied back to this water. But the water was here because we were a vast grassland. And in these early um, journals from those European settlers and the Texas Rangers, they talked about horses being scared to walk through their grassland. Grass is so tall, six and seven feet tall, that it was rubbing the bellies and getting in the eyes of the horses. As you can see from that photo, we just don't have that type of grass anymore. We have some of the healthiest grass in the entire hill country, but we'll never get the topsoil back. More on that later. So the terrain looked a lot like Germany and France and Greece and the Mediterranean where they're coming from. Rolling hills, forests here and there, but a lot of grass. And when you find an area that has a lot of grass, you have just found an area that you can plant crops. And when they settled here, though, 
although it was it, this magical lush grassland with lots of water, they didn't understand the system. They thought because it looked like their landscape back over there in Europe, that they could treat it like the landscape over there in Europe. But they didn't know what a grassland savanna needs and what keeps grassland savannas healthy. So I often use this term grassland savanna with kids. And what I have to do is I have to tell them that a grassland savanna is just like where Timon and Pumbaa live. I'm sure all of you have seen The Lion King. I've only seen it in Spanish when I was in seventh grade. That was a long time ago. Um, but the, the story rings true that it's a mix of grasses and forest, 50 to 80% grasses with those interspersed um, shrubs and then forests um, all over the place. So for us, where you think about where we had these dense forests, it was along our river systems and along our creeks, our creek systems and our riparian drainages. And that's really important to remember um, as, as we go through this. So this, this mixed area was dominated by this clump of grass right here. We have over 700 native species of grass in Texas. Don't ask me all of them because we have 98 right here in the Bear Bear Ranch Preserve, and I can name most of those. But when you see this grass, you have to break it down into levels and you have to understand that clump of grass itself. That is what you call a bunch grass. Now bunch grasses make up most of our mid and tall grass prairie grasses. And when I say bunch grasses, they grow from a basketball sized clump like that and they grow from the base each year, they come out of that clump. So every year, the new growth comes out of that. And then that's gonna die and bend over. And then here comes the next year's growth. And that cycle continues. So if this grass isn't regulated somehow, it will actually thatch itself to death. Keep that in mind, okay? So a little blue stem made up somewhere between 15 and 60% of our grasses. So that map all the way through Canada down into Mexico, riding the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains, the Great Plains was basically little blue stem plains. And this is a really valuable grass in terms of wildlife forage. It has a lot of protein and a lot of nutrients in it, but it also provides really good denning and nesting material for birds and small mammals. But to get the full snapshot, let's look at the typical native um, oak savanna that we have right here on the ranch. So these trees are mixed in with a vast array of grasses. Now, each one of these grasses needs that regulation, like I was mentioning. It needs that control. It needs a balance. And how does that balance happen? Well, most grasslands, whether they're savannas or not, were regulated from the top down, meaning as a primary producer, they occupy the bottom of the food pyramid. And then as you go up that, that trophic level, up that food pyramid, you get consumed until you get to the apex. So what used to be here to keep these grasslands healthy were these four-legged native lawnmowers, the American bison. There were once 50 to 60 million of these beasts roaming the North American landscape. Herds of hundreds of thousands would migrate through the Great Plains, down from Canada, in through Texas, down into Mexico on the eastern side of the Rockies. And then they continue their journey back up through New Mexico and Arizona on the west side of the Rockies to get back into Canada. So all of those areas, whether you um, had a desert like the Sonoran Desert or the Chihuahuan Desert, had a lot more grass than it does today. So these, these bison help keep these grasslands healthy because they're ecosystem engineers. They eat the grass. And then they put a lot of um, dung back on the landscape, a lot of nutrients back in there. They wallow. And when these bison wallow, they create what they call these little, these potholes. And those potholes then become its own entire ecosystem. So every time it rains, those bison wallows will fill up with water. So now you have a temporary wetland. So you're increasing um, habitat for things like frogs. Now they can go from one seasonal creek to another seasonal creek or even to a major river by having connectivity to water and not desiccating it throughout their journey. 
You attract more insects when you have that. Um, studies have shown that arthropod communities, even in bison wallows that haven't been used in 200 years, are higher than in a, in a plot of land right next to the wallow. So they're putting all that dander, all of their um, hair back in there. They're, they're putting seeds from other parts of the country. So they're increasing the heterozygosity of the genetics of your grassland too. So bison were huge, huge um, parts of keeping the North American landscape healthy. But like Europeans do, and like we all do today, we threw the system off. We put up fences and then we brought in our cows. We love our longhorns in Texas. We're very proud of them. We brought in cows, we brought in goats, we brought in sheep. We grazed it. We kept grazing it. Throughout the drought of the 1880s, we kept grazing it. That drought popped up, left a large amount of voids, and those voids did not get filled with grass. This is a photo, is a, is a little dramatic of what I'm talking about, but overgrazing can, can turn a landscape, uh, um, a lush grassland landscape into this, if you're not careful. When you start parlaying droughts and you start overgrazing, the history of the American um, plains is a combination of misuse of resources, i.e. killing the buffalo to expand civilization to the West by getting rid of the First Nations, and then bringing our cows and our goats and our sheep here to constantly graze. You know, again, when you think about these, these native grasses, they evolved with those bison. So those bison would only come through an area like the hill country every four to seven years. So they're not sticking around. Droughts are very common. We are still in a drought here in central Texas, even though we have 15 inches of rain, which is over half our yearly rainfall um, to this point this year in 2021. So because we threw that system off, we created all these voids, well, what happened? Well, the Dust Bowl happened. You know, overgrazing is terrible, but overplowing industrial um, farming is also terrible for the ground. Without something to hold on to that soil, when those droughts kick up, you have this. You know, this is an actual picture from what happened not even 100 years ago. You know, soil from Texas and Oklahoma moved into Pennsylvania and New York and covered a lot of infrastructure up. So what little crops were still growing in spots of Arkansas and Missouri were then leveled over with just dust. Okay? That's a very short amount of time. So when you think about Europeans coming and you think about post-Civil War expansion into um, the Western states, um, even the Midwest uh, as, as we go, where those bison were the keystone species regulating those grasslands, that was less than 50 years to go from lush grasslands with herds of hundreds of thousands of bison to the Dust Bowl, where your farming equipment is getting covered up with dust. In parts of Texas, like the Panhandle where um, Lubbock is, the, the, the rolling plains as we call it in Texas, they lost 70 to 80% of their topsoil. 70 to 80%. And it's still the most farmed area in our state. So you're thinking about topsoil that was once three or four foot deep. It's now a foot to two foot deep, okay? But it didn't replace itself overnight. So, we have to understand plant succession. Um, so even when you have these catastrophic events like the Dust Bowl, Mother Nature is gonna reset herself if she's allowed to. And so when you have even exposed rock, organisms like lichens and mosses move in, and then soil starts to build. And remember, soil is just organic and inorganic material that is capable of sustaining life. So it's got nutrients, it's got some sort of value that can grow stuff. So those lichens give way to weeds, to your annuals, and then your perennials and your grasses move in, then your shrubs, and then your first um, level succession forest, which is mostly softwoods and quick growing hardwoods. And eventually you reach your climax forest, which are gonna be your, your um, big mature oaks and your beech and your maple trees. So on the Bamberger Ranch, when Mr. Bamberger bought the property, he didn't have a lot of grass. We were in the late stages of succession. So we had a softwood move in that I'll talk about here in a second. 
But before I start, start talking about grassland and forest, there's something that we need to know too. And we haven't talked about this in terms of ecosystem management, but fire. This is a fire map of the historical um, frequencies of natural fires. So the indigenous tribes would start fires too to attract the animals. Okay, the very first prescribed burns were done in Western Montana. Um, but everywhere in the United States basically had some sort of, of fire cycle. Where I am in central Texas, we would burn at a frequency of two to four years. That's a lot. So that's a lot of resetting those grasslands. So even if those bison aren't coming through, there's something to take out that organic layer, that dead thatch layer off our native bunch grasses. So fires um, are really good for ecosystems when they occur naturally. What's happening now in California and Arizona and what was happening um, up in the Yellowstone region a decade ago, those are not natural fires. Again, it's because we threw off the system, okay? So let's start talking about the Bamberger Ranch. This is really our model of habitat restoration. The Bamberger Ranch is a 5,500 acre working ranch. We have a lot going on here. Uh, we're almost nine square miles and our landscape has a lot of relief. The front of the ranch, we are about elevation, 1400 feet. And as you get into the middle of the ranch, Okay, we go up to about 1,900 feet in elevation. So over 500 foot difference. Okay, so it's very rugged. It's very, um, very hard. And the BRP has been called a beacon of hope for Texans and land stewards all over the place. And I really hate that term, um, land ownership. I don't believe people should own land, even if you have the deed and title to it. Really what you are is just the steward of that land. It's your job to take care of it. So that's what we are with the Bamberger Ranch Preserve. So Mr. Bamberger um, purchased uh, the first 3,000 acres in 1969, and then he added about 2,500 acres throughout the years. And then in 2002, he gave it away, gave away over $25 million worth of real estate at the time to the nonprofit, which is the Bamberger Ranch Preserve that I now work for. And, and that beacon of hope um, is because our, our former director, uh, he's now retired, Dr. Andy Sansom, he was a director of Parks and Wildlife for a very, very long time. He called us a beacon of hope because at one time we were the largest habitat restoration project in the state, and that was in the late 1990s. But we love the fact that we're in the 30s now. I love saying that we're no longer the largest habitat restoration project. There's other people doing this, and there's other people doing this that have more than our 5,500 acres. But over the years, we've won a lot of stewardship awards, um, including some really prestigious awards from the Garden Club. We've won the Lone Star, the uh, Aldo Leopold Lone Star Land Steward Award from Texas Parks and Wildlife. But it didn't start this way. This is what Mr. Bamberger bought. This is a ash juniper forest, wall to wall covered with cedar. Now, I just used two words, cedar and ash juniper. It's very, very important to know that technically this tree is a juniper, but everybody around here calls it cedar. And that's because it smells like a cedar and it looks like a cedar, but there are no native cedars to the hill country, but there are six species of native junipers. And so I'm going to use those interchangeably. You know, Mr. Bamberger bought the property. He had the remnants of what looks like a channel where water might one be. So that could be, um, that could be the creek or that could just be a big run. It's really hard to tell because of the, the shape of the property. But what is definite is, um, what's definitely going on here is channeling effect or the arroyo effect. Look at how steep Okay, this channel is coming out here. And this has happened throughout the American Southwest because of post-Civil War expansion and the expansion of cattle. By leaving your cattle in areas, cattle walk down these banks and just erode that bank and get to the water when there is water there. 
And um, this is really important in areas uh, like New Mexico and Arizona, where they don't have quite as much water or the water is much more seasonal. So when Mr. Vanderbilt bought this place, he didn't know that he actually bought the headwaters to Miller Creek, which is a really important tributary to uh, the Pedernales River and the city of Austin and their water system. So these juniper forests, again, are natural. The early explorers write in their journal about how these dense thickets were so, so big and tough to get through. They could see the water. The, sea, the water wasn't but a couple meters away, but they couldn't get their horses through there and they could barely walk through to that water. So way, how we manage our landscape now is we keep these juniper trees, these cedar trees, where they would be naturally, where the bison and the frequent fires couldn't get to them. We keep these trees on our hillsides and down along the creek. We keep our forested areas on the hillsides and down along the creek where they would be historically. Because we understand the system, because Mr. Bamberger was an avid reader and he read all the journals he could get a hold of. And um, this area is rich in history with uh, the Texas Rangers. So when um, the Comanche Wars were happening in Texas, the, the Rangers were going all over the place. We had open range, which means there weren't fences. So all you had to do to run your cattle through here was basically just keep a hold of your cattle. Uh, if you've ever seen Lonesome Dove or read the book, that drive from Texas all the way up into Montana is is what happened um, uh, when when Texas was first being settled, and then once we got independence and the Civil War happened, everybody from the east thought they could come out west and become cattle farmers too, and we threw the system off. But these books are really important to the story, not only of habitat management and understanding the system, but also to the story of the ranch. When Mr. Bamberger grew up, he grew up very poor. But he read this book. Now, this book, Pleasant Valley, was written by a playwright. Lewis Bromfield was a playwright in New York City. And he inherited um, a farm in Ohio called Malabar Farms. Mr. Bamberger grew up amongst the Amish in rural Ohio. So Malabar Farms was not very far from where he grew up. And this book was all about how Lewis Bromfield brought this degraded Dust Bowl Ohio farm back to life. And it was the first time that the words habitat and restoration had ever been put together. And Mr. Bamberger remembered that book and he joined the army. And through the army, he was able to put himself through college with the GI Bill. After college, he took a job I bet most of you didn't even know existed. He was a door-to-door -door vacuum cleaner salesperson. So he used to walk around with these giant 100-pound metal vacuum cleaners and try to sell them to you. And one of the reasons he left Ohio and moved to Texas, because Texans are really nice. And they'll let you in, they'll give you a glass of sweet tea, and they'll buy a vacuum cleaner from you. And he was really, really good at selling vacuums. And then one of his vacuum cleaner underlings, uh, when he was the regional manager of Kirby Vacuum Cleaners in San Antonio, his name happened to be Bill Church. And when Bill Church's father passed away, he inherited four fried chicken shacks. Think of like the food, the food trucks, the taco trucks. They're so popular right now. That partnership between Bill Church and Mr. Bamberger grew into, at one point, a 1,400 um, store chain called Church's Fried Chicken. And Mr. Bamberger literally became an overnight millionaire on May 4th, 1969. And the ink dried on the Bamberger Ranch Preserve's first 3,000-acre contract on May 5th, 1969. But when he bought the property, he knew he didn't want an ash juniper forest. He knew it wasn't productive. But there wasn't a Bamberger Ranch serving as a model of habitat restoration. Mr. Bamberger just did whatever he could think of to remove the juniper, to try to get some of that balance back including plowing over acres and acres of juniper and then burning those slash piles. We do not do this now. We do not advocate for this now. Land restoration is not an overnight problem. Think about that dust bowl that took 50 years to create. That didn't 
happen overnight. Now the drought came basically overnight and the winds picked up, but the soil was already degraded and the plants and the grasses and the crops were already gone. They were already, oh, that land was already over farmed. So the system was broken before that, that drought and the wind of the 30s kicked up. But this is what Mr. Bamberger knew of back in the day. But he also knew he couldn't leave bare soil. He grew up and saw the Dust Bowl. So he planted native grass seeds, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth. And he spread it all over the place. But you can see from this picture where Mr. Bamberger is, is uh, standing, there's a lot of rocks. So where we are in the hill country, we've lost somewhere between 22 and 26 inches of topsoil. It's a lot of topsoil. So we grow rocks these days. But in amongst those rocks, we can still, got, we can still grow grass. I'm not bashing my neighbor over there on the right-hand side. I'm just telling you, not much has changed in our neighbor's landscapes over the 52 years since Mr. Bamberger has um, had the property here. But he also got lucky when he denuded the property and it looked like this. He had average rainfall, nice, gentle Irish rains. We're talking inches across days, not inches across hours. This is what we have today. And let's see if I can get this little video to play. This is taken two hours after we got um, two and a half inches of rain in 45 minutes. And so this seems to be the new normal. You can see how high the water was even before I, I took this. So this is just, the, this is Miller Creek. This is really close to the, to the headwater springs of that. And so the storm was absolutely crazy. And that seems to be what's happening more and more. We got 11 inches of rain in May. And the bulk of that came during three rainfall events, including one where we got three and a half inches in a little over an hour and 15 minutes. So luckily, um, nothing broke. No, the dams broke. There wasn't any major damage. But water's not supposed to flow like that across the landscape. Okay, we need grasses to slow that down. And even us who have really good grasses, that water really does still pick up and move. That same spot, just a few days later, looks like this. That's what the creek is supposed to look like. So, if he would have left that barren landscape, what little soil he still had left would have been gone. It would have hopped in the creek, the creek would have hopped into the river, and the river flows out into the Gulf of Mexico. There wasn't a model for him to go off of, but he had read enough books to understand that he needed grasses. Grasses were the key to soil and water health. So being a savanna, grasses are also the key to tree health because they're keeping that soil moisture in there. But the trick for us is the hilltops. And this is the bulk of the restoration effort these days to keep the forests off the, the hilltops. And that's because the hilltops are on top of what are called perched aquifers. So these aquifers are underground lakes. So most of the drinking water in North America comes from an aquifer. Um, ours are not are called perched because they're not a major aquifer, which means each one of our hills has its own storage container. So if you think of like a traditional cistern, a cistern for us is just one of our hills. And when you connect all of that, we have springs that connect into Miller Creek from all over our landscape. So it's really important. But our recharge zones, where the water gets back into the aquifer, are on top of those hillsides. So while we need some trees up there to keep that savanna mosaic, we wanna keep most of our trees on our hillsides and then down into the creek where they would be historically so, that our, so our springs stay flowing. It wasn't until um, five years into the restoration effort, three years into planting the first initial grasses that springs started to flow up again. And now those springs, aren't seasonal. We no longer consider them temporary or wet weather. They now flow year round. 
That's because when Mr. Bamberger had a juniper forest on his hands, water wasn't allowed to reach the soil. In a one inch rainstorm, and historically 70% of our rainfall events in the hill country are one inch or less. So if you have a juniper forest, only 21% of that one inch is able to reach the soil. And then all of those trees have those roots waiting for that water. But in our savanna landscape with our bunch grasses, 82% reach the soil. And those grasses aren't taking in um, the same amount of water that the trees do. By understanding the system, the water came back. And when the water came back, we noticed our habitat getting better because the birds came back, including the endangered golden cheek warbler, which is only found in central Texas. It's the only place it nests in the entire world. Um, it migrates north from the Oaxaca region, the, the mountains in central Mexico. And this bird is tied to the cedar or the ash juniper. But this bird is tied to it because it makes its nest from the bark. It doesn't like to build its nest in those juniper trees because junipers, just like cedars, have a saponin toxin. Okay, so they have a, a, a built-in insect repellent. So there aren't many insects that use it. Those warblers are insectivorous birds. So they want to build their nest out of that juniper bark in a 70 to 80% hardwood canopy forest alongside our hillsides and down by the creek. So they prefer sloped, they prefer sloped forests. Okay, so they really do prefer that the hardwoods on our um, hillsides. And when Mr. B first bought the place, he didn't have golden cheek warblers. Our bird list was only 48 species in the first five years of surveying. Now that might sound like a decent amount, but currently our list is up to 222 species. So to put that in context, we had, a, we had our um, spring bird count on April 21st this year, and it was cold and it was windy. It was just, uh, it was about 45, 50 degrees that day with a wind that was just, it was, it was un, unbearable to be outside. And we are still able to um, find 64 different species of birds in one day. So where it was 48 species across five years, we got 68 in four hours one morning, and it wasn't ideal weather. So our habitat is getting better. But again, the grasses brought that water back. And that water is really, really important um, for our ecosystem. The water brought insects and it brought that, that diversity of birds and then everything started to follow. Turkey came back. Our meso mammals like our foxes and bobcats and um, raccoons came back. And this is really important because of this map right here. This is a biodiversity priority index for North America. Biodiversitymapping.org uh, is really, really important. And all of you, when you look at making a management plan, should go to that website and see what is there. It will list endemics of trees. It'll list your, um, your diversity in terms of fishes. And it gives you a nice visual map to kind of see where you are. So here we are in the eighth most important or biologically diverse region in North America. Look where you are, up there, number seven. So it's really important to understand that. So when you break down into even a smaller um, eco, eco region, you can see that the map changes again and the colors change. Because even within the Great Plains, there were subplots. There was moisture differences across 100 acres. Okay, the way the mountains broke up the wind stopped the way that seeds would disperse naturally. So you really do need to understand what the system was naturally. But the big thing you need to understand is Mother Nature can heal. Your habitat can come back. And the further you improve your habitat, the more diversity comes. This doesn't happen overnight. 
You know, North, the North American landscape has been thrown off since the late 1800s. And here we are just uh, 150 years later, and we're seeing that the Bamberger Ranch is proof that in 52 years of habitat restoration, you get to see little miracles like springs popping up. You get to see the constant change in your bird list as your diversity improves, as you build more sub um, ecotones on your own property. We manage our hillsides differently than we manage our lowland grasslands. And our lowland grasslands are managed differently than our upland grasslands. So because we know how vast the system is, and because we can tell you what we've lost in terms of diversity, we can start to build that back up. And the proof is in the pudding, um, especially when you look at our bird list. So that's really important. So that is the first 45 minutes that I have for you. Um, that was a lot, and that went very, very quickly, I know. So does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Um, what makes topsoil so important? Were you able to hear her? Yes, I was. Oh, cool. Yeah, so topsoil is really important because um, I'm going to go, I'm going to go get a picture on my computer here um, and try to talk you through it. So topsoil, all right, here we go. Oh, topsoil would be on top of this layer right here. So this is called the uh, sea horizon. Um, and when you think of topsoil, soil is done in horizons. So you're gonna have a, a, a shelf like this. Your A horizon is right here. And that's your topsoil. That is your most nutrient dense soil. And again, soil is the mixture of organic and inorganic material um, to combine to be able to sustain life, i.e. grow plants. So your nutrient dense layer is here in your A horizon. Then you've got your B horizon, um, which is the, the soil that's not as lush and it's got a mixture of clay moving in there. And then you get down into your C horizon and not a lot grows in that sea horizon because it's very alkaline. So it's very basic, okay? More soil you have, the more um, acidic it can be. And this is gonna depend on where you are in North America. And for us, it depends on what peak or valley you're in on the ranch, um, because we do have some areas that have red clay and we have areas that have walnut clay and you can do different things with those types of soils. But to, to grow one inch of topsoil, in our climate in central Texas, it takes 500 years to naturally grow one inch of topsoil. Oh. So topsoil is just really important because you can't grow anything without it, or you're gonna be limited to plants that you can grow. And that's a scary thing too, um, because when you're limited to your plant diversity, you get monocultures. And when you get monocultures, who knows what can happen? So remember that cedar monoculture threw the water balance out of play for us. So it really ruined the habitat in this area. So good question. And I'll talk more about building soil um, in the next lecture too. Because that's cool, an important yeah. part. Do you have another question? Yeah. Um, how does the built-in insect repellent on juniper trees work? Uh, good question. So you are all probably too young. Um, I am not. Uh, I grew up with a cedar closet. Um, and so cedar trees and these juniper trees have a natural chemical just on the underside of their bark. So in their sap, it's a toxin in their sap that prevents um, or is not uh, inviting to insects. So when you think of oak trees or you think of hardwood trees, you always see these tiny little drill holes in them. And that's from insects getting in there and laying their eggs. But there's only three species of um, beetles that use juniper trees, three. That's not a lot considering that beetles make up one fourth of all living things known on this planet. But when you take like an oak tree, you can have 25 or 30 different species of just longhorn beetle using that one tree. 
So those oak trees get demolished sometimes um, during droughts because they're very weak and they can't fight off the insect larva. But these juniper trees can, can really um, take a hold because they don't have any insects that will damage them and weaken them. So they just kind of proliferate throughout that. So when you think of these juniper trees and you think about um, the, the grassland system, the bison were coming through in herds of hundreds of thousands and trampling all the little ones that the mockingbirds were planting by defecating out in the grassland. But if it, it's when we threw off that and we brought in our cows and we created more voids for more mockingbird toilet spots, um, because there wasn't insects or, or their fires weren't coming back through to help take away those junipers, where, um, um, so long-winded way to answer your question of, it's a chemical much like DEET um, or DDT is um, fabricated for us to keep insects away. It's just a natural resistance to insects. Yeah. Um, is there a particular reason why the rainfalls are much heavier now than they were when the ranch was first started? Yeah, that is a fantastic question. And I'm going to preface what I say, my answer to that with, we don't really know. Um, and everybody here is aware how science works. What scientists are thinking now is the rainfall patterns have shifted. And, you know, those dense forests along the equator push those pressure systems up to give us rains. We used to be able to time our rainy seasons um, by what was going on with uh, the hurricanes um, in the Gulf. Uh, and all that's tied back to that, that pressure. So those forests, with all that transvo evaporation along the equator, all that moisture that's coming off of the um, forest goes up into the clouds. The winds push it north. It follows the mountains and the forest regions of um, Mexico, and then would dump out onto the plains. But because we've thrown the ecosystems off, think of how many acres of rainforest burned down last year. And what did they do to the rainforest? They didn't plant trees again. They planted grass to grow beef. Okay, So they threw that off. And now these rains that are coming, these systems are forming elsewhere and then they're just sitting on top of us. So it's really weird. And I'm not a, a climatologist and um, I haven't read a whole lot on that, but this has been the new normal since 2015 when the fires um, out West started. You know, the North American landscape all worked together. Those ecoregions developed, they evolved over hundreds and hundreds of millions of years, you know, since Gangwana land, and uh, the, since the Rockies rose in Gangwana land, and then the plates shifted one more time and moved that interior sea land out to what we uh, to expose what we now know as the United States. So it just seems to be that way. Um, and there's 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 lots of record about these flooding events happening, but they seem to be more and more frequent. I have lived in the hill country since 2006. And I have experienced terrible drought um, in 2011 and 2012. Across those two years, we only got 14 inches of rain out here at the Bamberger Ranch. In 2015, we got 16 inches of rain in four hours. The Memorial Day flood that wiped out uh, the town of Blanco and Wimberley uh, caused a lot of damage. Um, and those type of flooding events just seem to be happening. Where those two to, to four inch rainfall events in an hour are now more and more common in um, late April and early May. Because we're not getting those. It used to be like, oh, okay, we're, it's, it's mid-April. We're going to get a, a couple rainstorms here and there and get five or six inches across the, the month. And the same thing will happen in May. And then we'll get a pop-up shower in June and July. We didn't get any rain last June. We didn't get any rain last July. We didn't get any rain last August. So we had 11 inches of rain going into the summer. We didn't get, see rain again until late October. And even then we only got eight inches in late October. So we only had about 22 inches of rain for all of last year. So that's six inches below average, but our average rain wasn't spaced out. We got, we got half uh, of, over half of our rainfall in, the, in, in two months. And so it just kind of throws the balance off of everything and, 
our trees just aren't as healthy um, as they should be. So even, even days like today, you can't see it here um, behind the curtain there. It's, it's a little cloudy, it's a little overcast. There's a lot of humidity in the air. And that's not gonna turn into anything because our trees just aren't respiring like they, like they should be. Um, and that's just the case across the entire country and across the entire world too. It's a very, very complicated question. I just have a follow-up question to that. Um, so like, does the fact that the um, Amberger Ranch is so much more biodiverse, it, do you, uh, the flooding, is it easier for you to deal with than for example, your neighboring land? Yes, absolutely. That's a fantastic follow-up question. Um, our neighbor, not to talk bad about his property over there, um, but he built a brand new house in um, 2014, and that 2015 rainfall event literally picked up his concrete foundation, and that entire building turned. So he built, not only was he stupid, and he built in the middle of a, a floodplain, um, but there was so much water in that one event, it actually moved his house. There was so much damage. It was, I mean, it's kind of funny to think about that. But the way water moves off that cedar landscape with nothing to slow it down that's outside of those trees, it moves so much faster over there than it does on the grassland here. There's so much more surface area covered than here. Once those, um, once that, that juniper canopy here gets filled up, okay, that 36%, so... Um, less than four tenths of an inch of rain, once that fills up, the rest of it spills out on the landscape. And when you just have, in our case now, soil, um, all that soil erodes. So the A horizon eroded, the B horizon eroded, and we're left with the C and Z layer um, a lot of times across here. And that's what happened to our neighbor. So our landscape flooded, and then it recovered very, very quickly. I mean, you saw, uh, let's see if I can find that other picture. Yeah, that flooding event turned into that. This is uh, days, this isn't weeks, this is literally days, okay? So it's just the way it, it happens. And you can see that our creek down here, it was actually kind of hard to see from this picture, but that's just concrete, that's rock. The, the creek here, a creek system looks like this. So the, everything is eroded away, but the rock. But our springs come out of that rock where this layer of limestone, this is called the Glen Rose Formation. It's an impermeable rock. Um, and then we have in our hillsides, we have a very porous rock called Edwards Limestone. Um, it's fossilized beach from the mid Cretaceous period. And all those pores, when you have grasses on top, let that water come through, then that water seeps through the hill and comes out of our um, aquifer in the forms of spring and meets up with our creek system here. Historically, the creeks and um, rivers in central Texas were really wide and they weren't shallow, but they had vegetation growing up in them. So the diversity of plants not only um, is important, but it's also important to where that diversity was. So those creeks and those river systems were so much diversity in there. You had grasses that are very important to bank stabilization. Um, you have trees that are critically important to bank stabilization. But these trees didn't just grow on the banks, they grew in the middle of the creek. And I don't have uh, any good pictures of that for this presentation, but if you walk the creek now, you're walking through grass. You're walking through um, shrubs, really important shrubs like button bush and elbow bush. You're walking um, up next to these giant cypress trees. And it's all because we restored that diversity that the creek is now healthy and still running. Even with all of those um, trees and plants sucking up the moisture out of the creek, it still runs year round, even in the drought conditions. It's really impressive. Mm. Yeah, so um, I was actually wondering, Jared, if if there's like a way that you could graze cattle in a way that kind of mimics the way that the buffalo used to do it. Yes, yes, you absolutely can. Um, 
when, uh, when we think about rotational grazing, we have to think about animal impact. And I'm going to touch on this in the, in the second part of the lecture. Um, but let's see if I can find a good, good picture here. Yeah, we'll leave it on this one here. So when you think about the bison coming through, coming right down the middle of the country here into Texas, where I am today, and migrating back up, it's knowing what your grasses can support. The grasslands up north in the Midwest can support a lot more animals than, oh, you know what? I just realized I wasn't showing you the map. Here we go. So the grasslands up here can sustain a lot more animal pressure because they got more rain than central Texas. So our drought cycles um, and our, our rain cycles are very, very tricky. Uh, the current science is we are on a four year drought cycle. So that means we get four years of below average rain and then we get two years of above average rain and that cycle continues. Currently, we are in that, um, we're in the middle of that four year period. So when you think about animals here, you would need to have um, large paddocks and be able to rotate your animals through very, very quickly. So when you think of herds of 200,000 bison coming through the landscape, you know, they're gonna make their way across that landscape in four, five, six days. So you can actually mimic that with what we call high intensity grazing. So flash grazing is another term for that, where you have a lot of mouths on the landscape and you leave them in that area for a very short amount of time, high intensity, okay, low duration. And then you just keep them moving and you keep them moving. And then you can circle back. And a lot of that circling back depends on how quickly your landscape recovers, which is typically tied to either soil health or the amount of water you're getting um, from precipitation or the amount of water you can, you can irrigate with. But if you're irrigating, where is that water coming from? And then what's the impact of that? Yeah, well, thank you so much, Jared. We've been talking about a lot of these concepts, so it's great to see them kind of in action at the ranch. And yeah, the plan is we'll take a, a bit of a break and then have you on for part two at, well, two o'clock our time. Okay. Yeah, Sounds thanks great. so much. Absolutely. We see you on about an hour. Yeah. See ya. Bye.